Wow, it's a lot of kids. Uh, they're on their way to their classrooms. This is the time in our service where we dismiss the children and they head off to their classrooms. And for the rest of us, I invite you to, to take a copy of God's Word and to open up to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. And as you do, I, I just want to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are abundantly kind and gracious. You are good and you do good. You have been good to us, Lord, and you have called us out of the the slave market of sin. You have redeemed us and given us uh, your very name, called us by your name, and called us into your own family. Lord, we're forever grateful. And this morning, my heart is burdened by um, what our brothers and sisters may be facing, people that we have not met yet, but we will spend eternity with. Uh, We pray for them, Lord, wherever they are this morning, in Ukraine, in China, in Pakistan, in Congo, all over this world. Uh, We thank you that you are intimately acquainted with their suffering. You are there with them in their midst, and and you promise to never leave them or forsake them, Lord. But right now they need strength. They need courage. And we pray that you would supply all that they need that you'd help them to persevere for as long as it takes until they're with you, that they would not give in or back down, that they would not be overcome by fear, but that they would overcome in the love of Christ. May they look in the face of their adversaries and have a heart that beats with love. May they be joyful even in the midst of their suffering. May we never forget them. Lord, help us to uphold them in prayer and to remind ourselves frequently of them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 26, <clears throat> in, in preparing the message uh, each week, that every passage is a little different, every passage um, has some uniqueness to it. We're studying the life of Christ and he is like a fine diamond in, in some sense. And every time you, you turn it, you see a different uh, refraction of the light through him. And it's just beautiful, it's beautiful. But this morning as I was here and contemplating about this passage and kind of mulling over, what, what emotion does this passage evoke? Uh, some passages do evoke strong emotion. I think it's Important for us to pick up on that. I mean, if we are studying, for example, and Jesus is healing somebody, uh, the emotion is exuberance, it's excitement, it's, it's just wonder and awe as you would imagine what the crowd must have been experiencing or that specific individual. And other times there's a sense of anger as, as Jesus is being mistreated maybe. At other times there's sadness. At other times there's just great joy. And this morning, as I was thinking about this text and and contemplating what is the emotion, the emotion is somberness. I don't know if that's really an emotion, I don't know, but that's the word that kept coming to my mind, somber. There's a, a deep sadness in this text that I can't shake. And I think you'll understand why. There's a another emotion that came to my mind and I felt in my heart, and that is anger. And I think that you will feel the same when we see people mistreated, when we see wrong done to innocent people, innocent lives. There should be a sense of anger and justice that rises in our hearts. And definitely that is so here. This is uh, just hours before Jesus would go to a cross, hours before he would breathe his last breath and cry out from the cross, it is finished. Uh, This is the closing moment, so to speak, of this great drama that has been and is Jesus' earthly life. Um, I'll remind you that this is just moments after the Garden of Gethsemane. This is during the final evening, so to speak, of Jesus' life. Um, And what Matthew is doing here, what Matthew has been doing throughout his gospel, his goal, I think, is writing a gospel the story of Jesus' life, to present Jesus as the true and rightful king 
of Israel to present Jesus as the Messiah. And Matthew has done a masterful job, I think, I think you would agree, of of presenting Jesus as the true King of Israel. Jesus has been presented through a couple different proofs. He's been presented through the things that he said. Obviously, there's the things like his genealogy and his birth narrative and all of those things that tie intimately into the Old Testament. But then when Jesus begins his public ministry, primarily it's two, two sides of the same coin. It's Jesus' teaching ministry. Every word he said was always and ever true. He never once misspoke. He never once uttered a careless word. He never lied. He never misled anybody. Everything he said was true. But also, the miracles themselves. Jesus says in John's gospel that uh, if you don't believe based on the things I'm saying, you should at least believe based on the things that I'm doing And that's the reality. The reality is no man in the history of the world ever did nearly as many things as Jesus did in terms of proving his divinity. Lots of people may have come along and said they were, but Jesus backed up every word that he spoke with miraculous healing power. He raised a man from the dead. He opened the eyes of the blind. He did all kinds of things throughout his earthly pilgrimage to prove repeatedly before thousands of people, not in private rooms, not behind closed doors, but in public for everyone to see that he was in fact the Messiah. And as he says, as I mentioned already, he tells in John's gospel, if you don't believe based on the things I'm saying, you should at least believe based on the things that I'm doing. So Matthew presents him as Israel's king, as the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that God had promised all these years, starting all the way back in the garden with Adam and Eve. In the sadness of our text this morning, the somberness of our text this morning, is the fact that this is the final moment. This is the the concluding act, so to speak, where Jesus stands before the Jewish council, where he stands before the highest authorities in Judaism, and they wholesale reject him. Let me read the text for us, starting in verse 57. Go ahead and follow along. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard the blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? This whole scene is one of complete injustice. In fact, I was trying to imagine other other stories in the Bible that, that communicate injustice. The things that we read where we're like, that guy doesn't deserve that. I thought of Joseph. If you remember Joseph back in Genesis... He was a younger brother, and he was sold into slavery by his older brothers. 
They were jealous of him, they didn't like him, and they sold him into slavery. I've been a mean older brother, but I've never sold my younger siblings into slavery. And Joseph goes through this whole ordeal, not only that one, but also once he finally gets to Egypt, he's also falsely accused there and thrown back into prison unjustly. And all the while, Joseph keeps trusting God. And I thought of Lot, or yeah, what's his name? Job. (laughs) Job is his name. I thought of Job, who was obviously a man who suffered, he suffered injustice because he didn't do anything to deserve the things that happened to him. In fact, you could argue the only reason he suffered the way he did was because he was righteous. Because Satan came and and said, he'll deny you, God, if you just take away all these blessings. And it was that very thing, the fact that Job was righteous, that brought about all this pain and suffering in his life. And one day he lost all of his children. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his own health. And he's left in a heap of rubble, a complete mess before his God. But he does not deny his name. And there's something when we read these stories and when we think about our own injustices, the times when people have wronged us and done us uh, wrong, we think, we get angry. We get a sense of Uh, injustice that rises up in our hearts. But I would say to you and to myself that not one of those things even comes close to what we read in this text. This is the perfect man. He is not only a man, he is God in flesh. He has already humbled himself by coming down from heaven to robe himself in humanity and to walk among us on this earth. He has served mankind through his teaching and through his healing miracles only to be brought to this moment where he is tried before an unjust unjust court. He's falsely accused and ultimately condemned. Let's make our way through this text, starting with really the setting, the way that Matthew sets this up. You will find in Mark and Luke and John some other details that Matthew doesn't include. Uh, Throughout this evening, there's more than one trial. Matthew just gives us this one, and then morning comes, and then he's handed over to the Romans. But it starts with the Jews in the night. But But Mark and Luke and John tell us that he also went before Annas, another high priest. And we'll get to that in a second. Verse 57 reads this. Then those who had seized Jesus, tying us back to the previous passage where the betrayer had brought a mob of men to arrest Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane in the middle of the night. He betrays him with a kiss. And then finally the guards lay hold of Jesus And now they have him. He is their prisoner. Already this is unjust. This is corrupt. This man did nothing wrong. And here they come in the middle of the night because that is when Satan works the best. They come in the night. They seize Jesus. And they led him to Caiaphas, the high priest. As I mentioned already, one of the other gospels tell us that first he went to Annas, the high priest. And high priests served in Israel, and they were, in a sense, the highest authority in Israel. A high priest was to serve for his entire life once he was chosen as the high priest. But like many things, that position of authority and power had become corrupt. There was uh, great authority attached to it, but also uh, great prominence and wealth. And the Romans, who were ultimately in charge, probably put Annas aside because Caiaphas was more useful to them. Caiaphas is Annas' son-in-law. Keep it in the family. Isn't that how it works? Keep it in the family. Keep the riches flowing. Caiaphas finds himself as the high priest. Annas, though, is also a high priest. It's kind of like the way we refer to our presidents. You might not be serving currently in office, but if you served as a, a president, you're still referred to as a president of the United States. So too, the high priest. So he goes before Annas, but then he comes ultimately to Caiaphas, and that's where Matthew picks up the story. 
they brought him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Mind you, let me just say this, this is the middle of the night. This is when decent people are sleeping. Why is this happening in the middle of the night? It's for that very reason that it has to happen in the middle of the night, because all those decent people that loved to listen to Jesus and that were enamored by his teaching and wanted to witness the miracles, they were largely undecided on what they thought of Jesus ultimately, but they at least knew he was a righteous man sent from God. And there were multiple times where the, the authorities wanted to arrest Jesus, but it tells us that they couldn't or they wouldn't because they feared the crowd. This is always the case with corrupt governments. What they fear the most is the people they govern, right? Don't you see that? Even now in our world being played out, governments that are corrupt and that fear their own people, so they have to lie to them, they have to mislead them, they have to use all kinds of propaganda in order to uh, keep them from revolting against their leadership. No different then. Same corrupt heart, same corrupt type of government. And these religious leaders were determined to put Jesus to death. They were determined to silence him. But the crowds would not have let, let that happen. And so, in this high and holy day, when the crowds are asleep, like good people should be, this crowd is awake and scheming and plotting. They've sent out a delegation to arrest Jesus, and now they've brought him back. And they find Caiaphas, the high priest, and all the scribes and the elders that had gathered. This is referring to the Sanhedrin, that ruling council of 70 men that were established to be the highest court of the land. They were supposed to be the most religious, the most fastidious, the most astute men in all of the land. And they were given that authority by God so that they could uphold justice and so that they could watch over the oppressed, so they could care for the needs of the people. But that had long fallen to the wayside. They now used their authority for their own benefit, to police their own, to line their own pockets with God's money. And so here they are, in the middle of the night, these men have gathered together at the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. Verse 58 tells us this. And Peter was following him. Seems like an odd detail, except for the fact that when you zoom out in this chapter, you see that Peter has a, a unique lesson he's about to learn. A very important lesson that he needs to learn if he is to ever to be fruitful for the Lord in future ministry. And so Peter has this, this, this underlying theme or this underlying story running through this whole story, this whole chapter. And we'll come to that later. But there's Peter, the brave Peter, remember who pulled out his sword in the garden and, and was willing to chop off a guy's head. Missed and got his ear, but that's all right. He's the one who before that told Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. I will die with you before I deny you. Well, when they seize Jesus in the garden, Peter and all the other disciples fall back. They, they, they distance themselves from this mob. But then Peter takes up pursuit. You can see him just lurking in the shadows, following close behind, not wanting to be noticed, but at the same time, not wanting to lose any distance between these people. They, he wants to see what they're going to do with Jesus. There is a sincere love. There's a sincere desire for him in his heart for Jesus. So he follows close behind and he gets all the way to the home, to the courtyard of the high priest and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. John tells us that there was this courtyard outside the home where they were meeting and they fired up a little fire. They put together a little charcoal fire to keep warm. It's probably a cold evening. It's the middle of the night. And there's Peter. He'll, he'll be important later. For now, he's just there, and it's good to know. Verse 59, moving on from 
the setting, we come kind of, Matthew takes us now into the inner part where all of this corruption is taking place, where this court has been uh, brought together and Jesus is there in the midst of them. Now the chief priests, notice it's plural, there's more than one. Caiaphas is there, it's his home, he's the acting high priest. But the chief priests and the whole council, this Sanhedrin, had been brought together. Matthew tells us it's the whole council. We need to note that in John, it tells us that uh, Joseph of Arimathea was one of the ruling council. He was one of the Sanhedrin as well, but he believed in Jesus. And it was Joseph of Arimathea that asked for the body of Jesus to be taken down off the cross after he was pronounced dead. And it was Joseph of Arimathea who paid for the preparations for Jesus' body and who ultimately donated his own tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea who did not participate in this decision. And so whether he's there initially and then realizes what's happening and distances, distances himself from this whole scene, or whether they didn't invite him because they probably knew where he would land. Maybe Joseph has already spoken his piece. And these men know where Joseph of Arimathea lands when it comes to Jesus. And so, rather than inviting him to this makeshift trial, they let him sleep. You know how that works, right? You gather around you the people who agree with you, who are going to uphold your case. And so Joseph is left out of the decision-making process but you can imagine the rest of the council is there. And in their minds, it's plenty of a majority to make a decision. It would have been made up of 70 men plus the high priest. And they would have voted on these major decisions. The Sanhedrin was the ruling judicial branch in Israel. They were there to uphold justice, God's justice and God's truth and equity in the land so that the people could live in freedom. Sounds good, doesn't it? And here they are, gathered together in the middle of the night. What I will just tell you on the surface is this. Everything about what these men are doing is unjust. It's corrupt. It goes against their own laws and their own establishments and their own practices. They should not have been meeting in the middle of the night. They should not have been meeting on a feast day. They shouldn't have been doing any of this that they're doing, but they're doing all of it in the name of justice. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Think of that for a second. They have called this trial for the purpose of of finding out how they're going to accuse Jesus so they can kill him. So much for innocent until proven guilty. They have decided long ago that Jesus is guilty and deserving of death, although there's nothing they can actually find to bring that about. And so this is a middle of the night trial. It's kind of a pre-trial so that they can figure out, so they can collectively pull together and decide, what are we going to accuse him of so we can kill him? They've already decided they want to kill him. Their hearts are made up. Their minds are made up. They're firmly established in this reality that we must silence Jesus. He has offended them in so many ways. Not because he is offensive, not because he misspoke, not because he uh, spoke lies, not because he did anything wrong to the people but because his light exposed their darkness. And they couldn't have that anymore. So this middle of the night trial is really just kind of a mock trial, trying to find something that they can pin against Jesus. And, and nightfall will be over soon, and the day will dawn, and the people will wake up, and the people will start to go about their day, and when they find out that Jesus is going to a Roman cross, they're not going to have any of that. And so they have to have something that they can give to the people when that time comes so the people will go, okay, that makes sense. We'll go along. Already, before the court is even adjourned, they have sought false witnesses 
were seeking false testimony against Jesus. So this is quite the crowd. You have at least 69, 70 men there gathered to make an adjudication about Jesus. You have false witnesses that have probably been already bribed, uh, that had heard Jesus speak and been a part of that ministry on some level. And they're there as well in the middle of the night. You have guards and the people that brought Jesus from the, the garden. But, but there's also a hushed sense that falls over this crowd. This isn't a riotous mob that is waking up the whole neighborhood. They have to keep quiet. They have to keep somewhat under wraps because the last thing they want is for the people to wake up and realize what is going on and call them out. But it's quite the mob of people. So they're, they're seeking false testimony against Jesus. But listen to verse 60. But they found none. But they found none. Four simple words that are packed with an immense meaning, that are packed with immense truth. Listen to this. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you're here today and you don't believe in Jesus based on the things he said, and you're not convinced based on the things he did, at least you should consider the evidence of what his own enemies thought of him. They hated him, and here's the highest court of the land, and they've paid off people to come in and bear false witness against him, and even though they've done all of that in corruption, they can find nothing to pin against his life. How would that go for you or me? If we were called into a court like this, and they sought false witnesses, it wouldn't take much They wouldn't need to probe very deep in my own life to find things where I broke God's law. It wouldn't even be a false witness. They could find true witnesses and pin things against me where I had clearly broken God's law. But here's Jesus, a public figure who has been walking among the people for three years, who has been constantly surrounded by crowds, whose occupation is speaking... There's nothing. I don't know how long this goes on where this, this, this steady stream of false witnesses comes through and they're trying to find something that they can make sense of. Note, they're already corrupt. It's not like they're looking for true witnesses. They're just looking for anything that they think will be adequate to give them the death sentence. But they found none. This is a great apologetic that Jesus is who he said he was. A perfect man sent from God. Though many false witnesses came forward, don't know how many, many means, but it's more than a few. Many people, this is going on maybe for a couple hours, they're bringing people through, they're trying to think of something All the while, Jesus is there. Many people came forward, but they could find nothing. At last, at last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Is that what Jesus said? Well, no, those words were recorded for us in John chapter 2. John chapter 2 tells us what Jesus said. At the beginning of Jesus' earthly mini- or public ministry, he cleansed the temple. He did it again at the end of his ministry, which we read about in Matthew. But at the beginning, when Jesus cleanses the temple, when he turns over the tables and drives out the money changers, the religious establishment come to him and say, whoa, 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 time out. What sign will you give to us to prove that you have the authority to do this? Jesus says, John chapter 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Those are Jesus' words accurately depicted and written down by John. But these false witnesses have said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. That is not what Jesus said. That's what they heard him say. 
That's what they concluded by what he said. But clearly, and we know this in John's gospel, that what he meant when he said destroy this temple was he was referring to his body. This temple where the presence of God dwells. Not this temple that is made with bricks and mortar, but the temple of Jesus' body. The false witnesses just regurgitate what they think they heard Jesus say. They regurgitate what Jesus said coupled with what they imagine he meant. Listen to the way Mark puts this in Mark's uh, record of the same encounter. The false witnesses say this, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and in three days I will build another not, ma- not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. So here they come, but in the minds of the the high priest, he says, finally, something. He's getting annoyed, I think. Night is moving closely or moving away, and daytime is encroaching, and they have to figure something out. So the scene changes a little bit. Verse 62, and the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? Speaking to Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is, that, that, what is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. For however long this whole mockery has been going on, Jesus hasn't said a word. And I'm dumbfounded by that. I know what I would have said. I can imagine what you might have said. But Jesus remains silent. He has said not one word. Well, the false witnesses line up and they come before him and they give their false evidence before this false court. Jesus doesn't utter a word of defense. It's staggering to me. The God-man who had power from on high, who had the authority of heaven, who could have called at one moment 10,000 angels to come and destroy these clowns, who could have just made himself disappear in their presence. Jesus has already done his battling in the garden. So when he finds himself before these false accusers, before these false witnesses, before this false court, his mind is already made up. He surrendered his will to the fathers in the garden. When he said, Father, if there's any other way, please take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He's prayed now for hours before this encounter, and he has fully surrendered his will to the fathers. There is nothing or no one that will move him from doing God's will. Hebrews tells us that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. It was the joy of honoring and serving and obeying his father's will, ultimately, but I think also, secondarily, it was the joy of knowing that his very act of submission would bring about life for people who believe in him, for his own. It was this act of humiliation that would one day bring about life for his children, amen? And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. This isn't the cross yet, but believe me, the suffering has begun. The false accusations, the ridicule, the mocking, the scandal of this whole event So the high priest grows more infuriated by the fact that Jesus doesn't say a word. I'm sure this man is one of those men that thinks, hey, when I speak, you better respond. This is a man of authority. This is a man of, that gets things done. Other men look up to him and respect him, and here's Jesus, and he says not a word, and he gets angry, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. He puts Jesus under oath. 
But it's not because he's curious what the answer is. He's not interested in truth. He already has his own truth. He's interested in finding a way to destroy Jesus. But now Jesus is sworn under oath, and he must speak. This also is illegal, by the way, according to their courts. You couldn't make a man speak and potentially bring about evidence from his own lips to uh, condemn him. He had the right to plead the fifth, as we would say. But now Jesus must speak. Jesus said to him, verse 64, you have said so. He can't just say yes or no because of this. Because in the minds of the high priest and this Sanhedrin, they were expecting a Messiah. They read the Old Testament. They had the expectation and the hope that Messiah would one day come, but they had nailed it down according to their own understanding. That's why they had so many run-ins with Jesus. Jesus, you don't fit our expectations. You have to go. Well, God did send his Messiah, and this is him. And so God would say, you need to get rid of your expectations. But Jesus, if he just said yes, then they would say, well, why aren't you destroying the Romans? So he says this, you have said so, meaning these are your words. This is your testimony. But, and then he adds to the high priest's words, but I tell you, From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus takes two prominent Old Testament passages that speak of the Messiah, Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, and he smashes them together into one statement here and refers to himself as the Son of Man, going to be seated at the right hand of God, Psalm 110 says, But a fastidious Jew wouldn't say the name God because they didn't want to potentially take that name in vain, and so they would often refer to God as the great power. And so Jesus even succumbs to their own expectations. He doesn't say here the right hand of God, even though that's what Psalm 110 says. He doesn't want to unnecessarily offend them. And coming on the clouds of heaven, referring to Daniel 7, that scene where the Messiah is there before the the Almighty in heaven, and the Almighty gives the Son of Man, gives the Messiah a kingdom that would smash all the kingdoms of the earth, that would be established forever and ever and ever. These were two well-known, some of the, the, probably the two most well-known messianic passages and Jesus smashes them together in one statement verse 65 what follows is complete and utter outrage then the high priest tore his robes which was a sign of of, of remorse of of anger it was a sign of that Jesus had done something horribly wrong by speaking this truth By the way, it was wrong, according to God, for the high priest to tear his robes. But who's keeping track of who's doing wrong here? Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy, meaning he has spoken contemptuously of God. He has misused God's name. He has blasphemed God. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And in unison, the Sanhedrin and probably everyone there says, he must die. He deserves death. The first time all of these people have been agreed the whole evening, probably. They're agreed on one thing. We will not accept this man to rule over us. He must die. The high priest speaks these words. The Sanhedrin chimes in with one accord. Then, verse 67, 
they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? This is nothing more than just sheer mockery, scoffing, ridicule. They are appalled at Jesus. The the hatred is just seething out out, out of them at this point. They can't stand this man named Jesus. Spit in his face, a sign of great disrespect. They struck him and slapped him and mocked him with the prophecy, you Christ, using Christ as a a derogatory term. It's ironic that they're accusing him of blasphemy because that's exactly what they're doing. They're blaspheming the Son of God. God incarnate, the one who knit them together in their mother's wombs, the one who made their lips and loosed their tongues that they might speak, and now they use those tongues to blaspheme the Son of God. And all the while, Jesus remains silent. It's just absolutely staggering. Makes me want to rush to the end. There's more to this story, believe me. Trust me. Read through to the end. But we need to be done for today. And before we close and go to our time before the Lord's table, I just want to draw out for us three important truths that are revealed in this text. Three truths, I want you to write them down. I want you to consider them this week. Because I think they're greatly important First, let us consider the meekness of our Lord in his suffering. Let us consider the meekness of our Lord. What is meekness? Meekness is power under control. This is the God of heaven in human flesh taking all of this mocking, taking all of this ridicule, and not reviling in return. This is the way Peter speaks of it. In 1 Peter 2, verses 22 to 23, He, Jesus, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's what he did in the garden. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly, and then he kept doing that throughout this evening into the morning. He kept reminding his soul to stay steadfast before the throne of God, to know that there is a court in heaven that would one day bring him justice. Why do we need to consider this? What is the importance for us to think about the Lord's suffering and his meekness in his suffering? Well, it's this. I think it is impossible to take a long, hard look at Jesus' meekness in the midst of his suffering while at the same time allowing pride to grow in your own heart. What is the remedy for the pride that lurks in our heart that sometimes raises its ugly head in our lives? To look to the meekness of our Lord who suffered and was reviled and did not retaliate. When we see his unjust suffering and his humility in the midst of it, it's hard for us to say, I deserve better. It's not to say that we don't face injustice, we face it on a daily basis. But you have no more rights than Jesus to seek your own revenge. Secondly, let us consider the corruption of men who profess to know the truth. These were the greatest scholars, Jewish scholars of the day. 
These were the most learned Bible students of their day. These were the men that were supposed to enact God's justice among God's people, and they were completely corrupt. Why is that important for us? Because this, we are very religious people. We study a religious book, and if we are not careful, our hearts go astray, and we pervert and twist and distort God's truth and make it into a mockery. How do we prevent ourselves from doing that? By staying humble with his truth. By surrendering to it daily in our own lives, lest we become prideful, arrogant, religious hypocrites. How will Satan destroy the work at Pleasant Home Community Church? It won't be a frontal attack. It'll be an infiltration. When we allow him to have advancement in our own hearts, when we allow ourselves to prize other things more than we prize the love of our Lord. So guard yourselves, even as I need to guard my own heart. Let us consider thirdly, the reason people reject Jesus as Savior. I just want to point out to you this. All of these false witnesses lined up. I'm sure they picked the best. I'm sure they, picked, they had a screening process. It's like American Idol. They, they only let in the contestants who have an actual chance. And these people went through a screening process and they, they came with their best chance to falsely accuse Jesus and there was nothing that they could say that would defile his character. There was nothing they could pin against him that was worthy of death. Jesus didn't go to a cross because he was misunderstood. He didn't go to a cross because he was falsely accused. He went to the cross because he spoke the truth in a way that was crystal clear. Even the way he quotes these verses, he even succumbs to their own silly things about not saying the name God, lest they pin that against him and say, well, he blasphemed, he said God. Can't say that. Which God never said you couldn't say that. He even surrenders that and says the, the right hand of the power because he wants to speak clearly. He wants to be understood. And the reason the, the Sanhedrin, the highest ruling council of the Jewish people, the reason they handed him over to the Romans to be crucified was because they knew who he was they understood who he was, but they hated it. Let us not be fooled into thinking by our culture that the reason people don't accept Jesus is just because of this, 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 or this. The reason that people don't accept and submit to Jesus is because he demands too much of their lives and they love their sin more than they love the Savior. That is the reason. That is the reason these men would not submit to Jesus. It's not because they rejected or they didn't understand his truth. They understood it perfectly. They just wouldn't submit to it. Let us consider these things, church, and I'll just pray as we close. Pastor Ryan will come up and lead us in a communion meditation and bring us before the Lord's table. Father in heaven, you are good hard for us to even comprehend what you experienced on this night watching your son be mocked and ridiculed that you stayed your hand of vengeance is staggering but you did it for us you did it to put your great name on display to show and demonstrate to humanity then and forever that you were a god who is rich in compassion that you're a God who is slow to anger and that you delight in saving sinners. Thank you for doing that, Lord. Thank you that we are the recipients of these great and wonderful blessings. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.